Once again, everyone, my name is Bobby Terrell, and I want to welcome you all to our Cash 22 Mental Health Forum today. Right now, it is 222. 22 people die by suicide every single day. That's a statistic. And if you think about how many people are suffering on a daily basis, and at some point in their life, they're saying, you know what? Enough is enough. And right now, we're saying that we're on the right path to making change. To making change in people's lives, making changes in our lives. And the reason why we're here right now is because we struggle with things. We also go through depression and anxiety. We've been, people been in the military and suffering with PTSD and things like that, and are afraid to open up and talk about it. So right now, we're here to talk about disclosure. What it's like having to disclose your mental status to friends, loved ones, coworkers, and it, sometimes that can be a very scary thing. And right now, we're trying to break that stigma, and we're trying to take away the scariness of it because people are suffering on a daily basis. So thank you all for coming here right now. And I want to let you all know that you are on the right path. Whatever it is that you want through in your life right now, you're on the right path. And that's why we're here. So without further ado, I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself. My name is Bobby Terrell. I am from Raceland, Louisiana, but I currently live in Houston, Texas. I am a board certified assistant behavior analyst. I have a bachelor's degree in sociology with a minor in psychology, and I am two months away from finishing my master's in special education with a focus in applied behavior now. Thank you so much, man, because it, it's been a struggle. It has been a struggle, and I'm tired. But I'm almost at the finish line, and that's something that, that over the last couple of months that I had to push through the depression and push through the anxiety to get to the finish line, and I'm almost there. And some people don't make it to the finish line. And so that's why we're here. So also, I am an actor, writer, director, producer, and my goal is to continue using my platform to have discussions like this that are very much needed in society. So we're going to have... Welcome to our Catch-22 Mental Health Forum. I'm your moderator, Bobby Jarrell, and we're going to go ahead and get this conversation started. So at this time, I want to welcome out our host of the event, the lady who thought of this whole idea and made it come to life here today. So give it up for Ms. Tessa Causey. Have a seat, ma'am. Thank you, thank you. All right, go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Etesta Palsy. I am a 26-year Army combat veteran. I served uh, in the military, in the Army. I went overseas, and I think that's where my journey started uh, with my mental health illness. But at the time, I didn't know, um, and I. I was a people pleaser, and I was always um, keeping busy. But at the time, I didn't know that what I was doing was I was, it was a way of deflecting. I was avoiding myself by helping others and always being there for everybody else but myself. And so that led me to a deeper, darker path in life. And so um, in 2012, I experienced um, a uh, tra traumatic incident. And over the course of, the, of mm, let's say, four years, I couldn't um, get past that, not even with therapy. And so eventually, I, I got to a point where I had to do something because I realized that at 48 years old, I did not want to live that life for the rest of my life. And so this is where I came into um, trying to figure out who I am, what I am, and where I want to be in life. So my frustration uh, increased over the years instead of getting better, even with therapy, because I was going to therapy and I wasn't, um, I wouldn't say I wasn't taking it serious, but I wasn't doing the work. And in order for a change to occur, you have to do something different. You have to take action. You can't just say, I'm going to therapy. And that's what I was doing, just going through the motions. I was still pouring into other people other than my own self. And so um, 2017 uh, led me to a point of frustration where I wanted people to understand what I was going through because I was tired of hiding. 
uh, what I was, what was happening with me. And it wasn't easy. It still took me another four years to get to that point, right? And so this is why we're here today. Because God gave me the vision and he made provision for me to make it happen. And, and it was up to me to make the decision to move forward with it. And I put it out there, had no clue of who was gonna help me. And this is where I come, I put it out there on Instagram, I'm not a social media pet person, but I knew that in order for me to move forward, I had to have, have a team. And, and so I just put myself out there and this where this beautiful panel come from. So I just wanna say thank you before we get too far, I want to say thank you for you guys for showing up and being here because just you showing up, it, it, it tells us that you're here to support. You're here to learn how to support. And that's the whole mission behind this event, not coming from uh, a, a treatment side. So I wanna make sure you guys understand that we're not doing this to figure out how to treat somebody. We're here to figure out how to support them. And take a, take a note to what each of us say um, helps us out when we're in uh, that space. Take copious notes and figure out, I know you, some of you are dealing with people who have it, have mental illness. So take time and figure out, listen, be present, and write down some takeaways from this event. I thank you again for being here. So what does this event mean to you? This event to me means that um, I'm basically helping myself heal mm -hmm. through putting out there and helping others. Um, when we are, we're, we're actually born nurturers, whether we, and, and, but there's balance in everything we do, right? So when I go out and do things for people now, rather than me trying to fix them, I ask them, how can I support you? What can I do to help you? So in this event, I want you guys to understand that we're not looking for somebody to fix us. We're looking for you to listen, be present with us, be patient with us. Now, I know for me, like growing up, I experienced a lot of trauma as a, a kid, and I didn't have anything like this to attend as a child. So for you up until now, like, did you have these type of events to kind of support you along your journey? No, I didn't. Um, actually, um, I think in 2019, uh, Mr. Newell, my sister, on a whim asked me to speak at the church to the youth. Unbeknownst to her, on my drive to Mississippi, I had prayed to God to, you know, give me a platform to speak because I knew that there was a need for, um, people to learn more about it. We hear uh, providers all the time talking about treatment and do this and how to cope and this and that, but we never hear people talk about how to support. And you're gonna keep hearing me talk about support, 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 because that's the most important piece to recovery. And dealing with a mental illness is, it's, it's everywhere. There is nobody in here that can say that they haven't experienced depression. If we're honest with ourselves. Nobody in here can say that they've, you know, not dealt with depression. So I feel like we have to, this, this is what we need. We need more of. So I want you to take from this, don't just leave here and, and let it be the end. Keep it going. So question to the audience, have any of you been to this type of event before? Wow. Wow. You should be raising your hand because you did something similar along the lines. And, and the thing is, as Tessa was saying, there's different ways of responding to your trauma and the things that you've been through. And we get caught up in this mind that there's only one way to fix this. There's only one way we should do X, Y, and Z. But the purpose that we're here for today is what worked for me may not work for her. It may not work for you. But if we're giving you a pool 
of different things and different tools that you can use. So the goal is to write down what as much as you can. Even if you think it don't apply to you, it may apply to a friend. It may apply to a, a family member. And so that when it's happening, you're able to say, okay, they talked about this at the panel, so let me try this approach. And if that approach don't work, then say, okay, what other approach can I take in trying to support this loved one or even supporting ourselves? Mm -hmm. So that's why we're here. And, and it's, it's just creating a pool of different tools that we can all use. So do you have anything else before we bring out the panel. Yeah, I just want to say that um, when you're dealing with a mental illness, um, I know if, if you look up here, you see Catch 22, and you see the two is upside down, right? And as of late, we've had so many young adults to die by suicide, right? And so when you see the upside down two, that's the way we feel when we're going through, when we have a dark moment. So. The, the two, it feels like the world is on our, our uh, shoulders. But we have to be encouraged that we got somebody to support us along the way and bring us through. And, and when you see the semicolon, uh, that means that a, a sentence, there's a new sentence that's going to start after that, right? So life continues to go on. And, and the hope, we have hope in the butterfly, the transformation. So the old, and that was an issue that I had, I kept trying to stay in the past. I kept trying to stay, I, well, not stay in the past, but I kept trying to go back to the old me, the how I was. Right, and so for years, that's why I kept trying to get back to the, the high functioning, high efficient. I mean, I used to be on it all the time, but then I had to realize that I needed to get used to my new normal. And that's when, when my change, you know, started to occur. So that's when you see the butterfly, you know, it's, there's always hope. And then we always, it's a new transformation. Awesome. All right, so at this time, I'm going to welcome out our panelists. We have Ms. Domisha, Ms. Kimberly, Ms. Jasmine, Ms. Yanta, and Ms. Jermisa. <laughs> All right, so before, all right, so before we get started, I want you all to know that we will be talking about uh, some heavy topics, and there may be some triggers for some people. Um, if you need to step out, then just pl please feel free to step out. There are some tissues on the table. If you need some tissues, I ain't saying you're going to cry, but if you have to cry, go ahead and cry. If it's an ugly cry, we don't mind. We didn't been there. So feel, feel free. That's what we're here for today. Now, for the last couple of weeks, I've been asking myself, how am I going to start this conversation? How am I going to transition into this conversation? And I told myself the purpose that we're here today to do is talk about disclosure. And for the longest, I was looking at disclosure as telling people, hey, I have a mental illness. But then I had to realize that a part of disclosure is also being able to say, right now in this moment, I'm dealing with my mental illness and I'm not in a good space. And I've struggled with being in the moment and disclosing my mental status at that time. And so in order for us to have an open and honest conversation, we have to be transparent. We have to be honest. And a part of that is just me being able to say that I've been struggling the last couple of months. And being able to come here and have this conversation, it's, it would be like hypocritical of me to sit up here and say, oh, this is what worked for me. But yet I'm not being honest about what I'm going through. And I have my friend Tawana here. And we had a conversation the other night, and I had to stop and look at and ask myself, am I being true to who I am as a person? Am I being honest about my struggles and how I'm overcoming them? And for us, we're, we're here to share, but we're also here to, to soak up what the others are saying, because we all have our own individual experiences and our own ways of dealing with things. And just like you all are sitting there and listening, we're listening, we're growing, and we're soaking it all in because we're on a daily basis, we're all still dealing with a lot of the same things. So the first question that I wanna ask is, what was it like for you ladies preparing to come here for this e event and getting yourselves into the right mental space in order to come here and have this conversation? And I wanna start with you, Ms. Jermisa, because that's our designer who had the fashion show here today. And I know that when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you talked about like Sundays being your day to yourself and your day to kind of recuperate. So you had to finish your line for the fashion show, but you also had to prepare mentally to have this conversation. So what was it like for you the last couple of weeks? Uh, normal. Mm -hmm. 
um, Sunday is my day, so me being here and talking about mental illness is a part of who I am, so this also is my day as well. Um, prepping is the norm, like you go going to a job every day. Um, what I do is no different from anyone else. It might be on a stage or something, but it's still, I just have a job like everyone else has a job. The transition of coming here, I didn't start prepping on this a couple of weeks ago. I've probably been pre prepping for this moment all of my life. The ability to be able to talk and express myself with the understanding of being able to, as you say, disclose. Because my point of view with disclosure is um, now, I'll let people know. It's documented that I'm not responsible for my actions. So what, what is your actual diagnosis? <laughs> my diagnosis is schizoaffective, social affective disorder, seasonal affective disorder. And I keep forgetting the last one, but it, I think that's the one that I need to remember. What is the bipolar mixed in with the schizoaffective disorder? So that kind of like goes hand in hand. The biggest thing that I have a problem with is not hallucinations or things like that, because what I do, I have to use my imagination a lot. So that helps to balance that out. So can, can you give us a little bit about, a little bit about your background? Where are you from? Real I life? am from Hollandale, Mississippi, and half of the people in this room are from Hollandale, and we have been knowing each other all of our lives, from throwing rocks at each other to graduation and school activities and functions and church and leaving and going different places and careers and everything. We actually grew up well-rounded with each other. Uh, I started sewing at an early age. Hollandale was really, really good about supporting people when they know you have a talent. So I know you mentioned that with your fashion that it was kind of connected to mental illness and how you, that's like basically how you express yourself. Yes. Can you briefly tell us like what the pieces meant to you? Um, first of all, the green, the dress, that was to emulate the, uh, the mental health ribbon, the shape okay. and how it flowed to the floor and everything. That was to emulate the ribbon. The hood is for when you have a closed head and everything is just stuck in there and you really don't have a way of, it's like it's a barricade, of barricading everything in your mind. The rider's suit is for when you're riding a horse or when you're riding something, you're just free. If when you're, even if you're taking a, road, a ride down a road, and you look at your environment and your surroundings and your mind just goes there to focus on the prettiest of that area that you can see. The angel suit uh, is a part of the softness that a lot of people don't recognize with mental illness. Sometimes when people think of mental illness, they think of crazy and irate and everything. I'll tell anybody, a person with a mental illness would do something to hurt themselves before they would hurt anybody else. That's why suicide is so prevalent. That's why when things were going on and people were saying crazy people, crazy people, no, 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 don't look, don't go there. And I take everything with my art and that's my palette, like Picasso had paint, uh, Beethoven had the piano. Fabric is my palette. And I actually can't do it in my sleep, but I actually like to do it when I'm woke. <laughs> but fabric is, because when I buy fabric, I play with it like you playing with Play-Doh. 
I'll take it out and I'll whims it to see how it flows. Or I might hang it a certain way to see how it drapes. I play with it like a kid in a with Play-Doh. So do you feel like sewing, is that your outlet when you are at your highest when you're dealing with? Sewing has always been my outlet. Exercising too, but as you can tell, not only do I look like a basketball, I feel like one right now. Now I'm gonna COVID, you don't know what your weight gonna do. Well, exercise ain't necessarily. It's, 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 it's about the physical and the appearance. Sometimes it's just like the mental side of it. And I think that's it because I have I'm eating more healthy now than I've ever eaten before. I mean, home cooked meals. No desserts, a lot of water and everything. And like you say, the mental health pressure, and that's another thing. Most of the time when I am in my mental health illness, you can tell by my hair. My CSI pointed that out. She said, she's fine. But when that hair ain't looking right, mm -mm, just stay away. And that's how I wear my stresses in my hair. It's the little things that when you see with people with a mental illness that you wouldn't seem to think of like the normal thing that somebody else can do. Sometimes when you have a mental illness, the hardest decision you have is brushing your teeth in the morning. Yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more. So I wanna, I wanna ask Miss Jasmine. So what, what has this couple of weeks been like for you preparing? I know that you say you're shy and yes. that it's a build up. So I want you to introduce <laughs> yourself and let everyone know a little bit about you and then tell us what it's been like for you the last couple of weeks preparing. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Camp. Interesting enough, I am a trauma coach um, and a motivational speaker, but I am shy at first. Takes me some time to warm up. Um, this experience for me, it has been nervous. It has been frustrating at times, just in the preparation, um, not getting down here, but being willing and open to share a part of me that I've suppressed for so long. Mm -hmm. And um, my diagnosis is bipolar depression, um, separation anxiety, as well as um, borderline autism. So I, before I even signed up for this, the first thing I thought about was how am I gonna tell my story in a way that people actually like it? But then I had to realize the same practices I do with my clients, I have to apply to my own life. And it's not about whether somebody else likes my story, but am I willing to share the authentic Jasmine so that people can see what mental illness looks like, but how they can overcome it for themselves. Thank you, ma'am, thank you. Ms. Domisha, I want you to introduce yourself to the audience and let us know a little bit about yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Domisha Fleming. I am from Florida, um, from Auburndale, Florida, um, originally from Lakeland. I'm the mother of three beautiful kids, 25, 16, and eight years old. Um, my mental illness diagnosis was yeah, depression, separation, anxiety, <laughs> wow. Oh. <laughs> and the preparation of getting here was just thinking about being transparent when I got here. And knowing that um, three years ago when I decided to go get help, that I was tired of saying that I was healed, but I wanted to be healed for real. And so even in that, I am now a master certified life coach. I'm a purpose coach. And my goal is to help people, not just women, identify their purpose, but live on purpose as well. So yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So what, what has it been like for you preparing? Preparing to get here has, um, my nerves had been all over the place. Um, however, the last three days leading up to me flying out on Saturday, I had to consecrate myself. Um, because I didn't know um, what was going to happen, how it was going to happen, but I wanted to make sure that I had consecrated myself enough to know that when being transparent, transparent don't, doesn't necessarily mean tell all. 
and I didn't want to speak from me today, but I wanted God to do what he needed to do on today. So that's what it's been like for me getting here. Kimberly, I see you said, you're not looking at me. You, you, you can't avoid me now. You can't avoid me. Just because you ain't looking at me, I still see you. <laughs> she was looking away the whole time, like, don't call me, don't call me. <laughs> so introduce yourself to everyone and let us know what it's been like for you preparing to come here. Okay, I'm Kimberly Robinson. Um, it's been anxious. I've been excited um, ever since I was diagnosed and knew that there was something real going on. I've, I've been excited to share because for so long, I just felt different. Um, my, my diagnosis is major, severe major depression and um, also PTSD. Um, I say God, meds, and therapy is the best thing that ever happened to me. I've been on meds probably for about 15 or so years, and I've been in therapy uh, even longer than that. Um, and I just wanted to share, because there, it's like such taboo in our race to seek therapy or to take meds. Everyone wants to say, well, just pray about it. And it's like, faith without works is dead. So, you know, just like God put doctors here to you know help you with surgery he put doctors here to help you with your with your mind and your mental illness and it's okay you know i a lot of times felt like what did i have to be sad about um because i don't have a traumatic childhood um there's no such thing as perfect so of course it wasn't perfect but you know i don't really have anything where I could at least say, well, yeah, it's because of that, that's why I'm the way I am. So it was really hard trying to understand why I'd be up and down and angry and sad and internalize everybody else's stuff. So um, therapy has, you know, really helped me to, you know, come out of my shell somewhat and, and see myself differently and be okay with the fact that I'm not okay. My favorite saying right there, it's okay not to be okay. All right, Miss Yanta, last but not least, introduce yourself and let us know what it's been like for you preparing to come here today. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for showing up to hear our stories. Um, as he said, I'm Yanta Haynes. Um, that's me, nothing else. <laughs> I am uh, 42 years old. I have a 21-year-old daughter. Love her dearly. Um, she is my rock and my support. I have a great support system, which is my partner. She's somewhere around here. Um, she is my support system. I have Tessa, who is my support system. And I'm saying this because I wouldn't be sitting here without these support systems, because those are what led me to be here today and to be able to speak of who I am. I am diagnosed with personality disorder, suicide tendencies, military sexual trauma, with sexual trauma outside of the military, and I have deep depressions. Um, that sounds like a good cookie jar. It's a big ball of fun when you don't know you're in it. So I am here because I was led here by my um, journey. I am an empowerment female coach, and the only way I'm a empowerment female coach because I have to empower myself. And I had no one to empower myself until I knew I wasn't myself, and that's when the empowerment became. So I help women find their superpowers. Um, anything else you want me to say? There's, there's more you want to share? I could just, you know, I have multiple degrees, and I say that because I say I have a bachelor's in business management, a master's in supply chain, human resources, uh, um, project management, and I say that to say I have all that, and I didn't want people to know that I was lost in my own life. I had all that education and couldn't educate myself to get out of bed in the morning, to move myself, to even call somebody to come help me. I was, I stay in the country, and I was glad I stayed in the country because everybody always say they're too, I'm too far to visit. And that was my shelter, being too far to visit because you couldn't come see what I li lived like and how I was living. And I knew you wasn't going to come check on me. So that is bad for me because I have suicide tendencies. And when you have suicide tendencies and you don't have a support system to actually support you to come out to your house because you're far away, that feeds into my suicide tendencies because now no one really cares about me because I could be dead and no one show up. So 
I just say that to say that it's very important about the support system that you have around. Sometimes I have people who call me, hear me on the phone, and they's like, no, nah, I need to see you in person. I need to say, see you on FaceTime because you sound good over the phone, but when you see the person's face, you can see their emotions even more. So sometimes when your friend tells you they sound good, they feel good, they're okay, go see them. Yeah, Get them yeah. on the phone, physically look at them. And I, I can say this to Tesla because I think I've called you one time when they went into the COVID stage and um, the, our good old therapist wanted us to get on these telecoms. I was not down for it. But I realized why they wanted us to get on the telecoms because we can tell all kinds of lies to them on the other side. And I have told all kinds of lies to people on the other end. Yeah, so I work with kids that have autism and the other, I think it was last week, I was uh, met with one of my th therapists that works with the client and the client via telehealth and I was talking to the client and I asked him, I was like, how's your day going? And he said, it's good. I said, on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling right now? He said at 8.6. I was like, that's great. Are you going to ask me how I'm feeling? He <laughs> said, no, because I can, he said, I can tell by looking at you that you're happy. I said, no, it doesn't work like that. I said, you can't tell. I say my outer appearance may look like I'm happy because I'm working and that's what I have to do, but that doesn't mean that that's how I feel on the inside. So my question for you ladies, are, and I want to start with Ms. Tessa, what does your depression look like for you? When you have to show up to the world, what does that look like? My depression looks just like this. <laughs> Oddly enough, it looks just like this. Um, when I'm looking my best, I'm feeling my worst. Mm. Yeah. Say, that, say it again, say that again. When I'm looking my best, I'm feeling my worst. Mm. And uh, Yonka can attest to this. I've come, I've shown up to work several times looking like this. I don't wear makeup at often, but when I do, then yeah, I need to dig a little deeper uh, because I'm trying to hide something. Yeah. And uh, I work harder. Uh, and so, um, but when you come to my house, uh, depression looks like me loving Mr. Brown. <laughs> and if you know me, you know who Mr. Brown is, right, Pam? That's my couch. <laughs> and he holds me so tight. <laughs> Mr. Brown is so hard sometimes to get away from him. And um, I have friends that call and, and fussing me about uh, not opening up my blinds. I, I don't, and I should uh, even more to let the light in, but that's what depression looks like for me, uh, constantly laying on the couch. And like Jamisa said, it's hard to do the simplest thing. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, um, Sue, she seemed to know when to check in on me. <laughs> and, and she'll say, no, um, how are you really feeling? She's not just going to accept all is well, my favorite. <laughs> She's she going to dig a little deeper. Well, what you doing today? And those are some things you have to do, but that's what my depression looks like. So, Jeremy, so I know you mentioned that when your hair is a mess, that's when you typically are feeling your worst. So what does depression look like for you when you have to continue to, to show up even when you're not at your best? Actually, um, it goes back to what Tessa was saying about working so hard. When my children were at home, I was working 80 and 90 hours a week as a nurse for 11 years. So I want to ask this to you and to, to Yanta. Do y'all feel that when you are depressed, it's like working and keeping moving and doing as much as you possibly can, is that like a coping mechanism so you don't have to stop and think about what you're going through? I hear y'all like that from the music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to give you an example. I gave you all those degrees I got, right? Mm -hmm. Those are what got me through my depression because that's the only thing I had to hold on. That's the only thing that made me feel worthy that I can use my mind to educate myself because everything else was trash to me. Relationships, people in my life, they wasn't doing it for me. So educating and knowledge was the only thing I could hold on to because you couldn't take that from me. And I didn't have to give it to you if I didn't want to give it to you. So when I finished my master's, I think I told Tessa too, like, she's like, <laughs> I broke down. I didn't know where to go. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to get out of it. I didn't know how to start. I just wanted to continue with school and keep learning because I knew that was something I can do every day. 
whether I felt like it or not, that was something that got me through my days. I knew it was words on the page. I knew it was a grade. They're going to tell me what I did right. They're going to tell me what I did wrong. And I'm good. But I had to keep going to make myself look like how I was for everybody else. And everybody cheer you on. Yeah, you did that. Yeah, you did that. You made an accomplishment. You made an accomplishment. But inside of me, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm about to die yeah. because I have nothing else. That's the only thing people see in me is accomplishments. See me driving forward. They see me moving ahead. Of, but that's not me. I just want to chill like them. I want to be irresponsible sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and they wouldn't allow me to be irresponsible. Yeah. I had to always be responsible. So one of the things that I was thinking about when, when you're dealing with depression, at least you know I can say from my own experience, I always needed something to hold on to. As long as I had like that person or like the job or school to say like that's my anchor whenever I'm going through my situation. And then like you're saying, when that goes away, you find yourself almost lost looking for that anchor. So what are the things that are in your lives now that are your, your anchor when you know, okay, when I'm going through it, I know I have this and it's gonna get me through. And I'll ask you, Miss Domitia. So in my life right now, what I have, um, I forgot to mention earlier, I'm also the founder of a mentoring organization. And again, even with that, that's my anchor. Mm -hmm. That helps me get through what I'm going through because I'm able to help someone else. So even in my lowest point, I'm always helping, I'm always serving. And a lot of people don't understand or realize at that moment, wow, she's really going through something. I have been going to, through something to the point where I didn't know if I was going or coming. But when I get on that stage or when I'm serving those girls, it's like I'm the best me that I can be. But in the background, I'm lost. So let me ask you a question. It might be a little deep question, all right? Okay. If all of that was gone today and you didn't have that organization, what would Omisha do? You're right. That is a very deep question. <laughs> what would Domisha do if she didn't have that organization today? She will find something else mm. to be her anchor. And see, I, I, what I like about that is a lot of people think that when they lose that one anchor, that that, that was the only anchor there is. Yeah. But there are other things, there are other people and other ways of going about right, it. Right. Miss Kimberly, you, you good? Yeah. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to be over there looking away now. So you mentioned about taking, uh, you said God, therapy, and medicine. What I love about that is, especially like coming from the black community, growing up, I didn't, I didn't know anything about therapy. Like I saw on television, it was like, oh, they laying on the couch. That's what I thought it was. Yeah. My first time going to therapy, I'm like, what a couch? I thought it was laying on the couch. <laughs> so when, how did you get to that point where you was able to say, I'm okay with therapy? Well, I had uh, an embarrassing outburst. Um, at the VA hospital, and um, <laughs> you, you should be right on in there. <laughs> not this outburst. <laughs> and um, once I was calm and I came back, and I'm 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 kind of skating through the appointment. When I came back and I was speaking with the doctor, and I'm looking at this computer, and everything I said is on this computer, and now I'm feeling like, oh my god, you know. And so she asked me. She said, "Have you ever?" Um, been on meds and I was like no she said would you be interested I said anything to stop feeling the way I feel now because and even now sometimes it, it scares me I'll see somebody and they look so familiar to me and I'm hoping that's not somebody that I lost it on mm -hmm. you know um it's not a good feeling you know uh I'm glad that people that know me know that my heart is good but at one point before I was on meds I could go from zero to a hundred like you know, and it, it, it is not a good feeling. And then, you know, it's like then when I come down from it, I feel sad. Or like sometimes um, I'll, I'll find myself where I used to be just really outgoing. I found that I had to learn that I can't deal with everybody because I internalize yeah. stuff. Um, I even found myself like when we did the, that was my first Zoom meeting when we did the meeting to meet okay. each other. Mm -hmm. And I was I was so proud that I was you know there on time and was able to do it because I was just just I was just really anxious about oh my God I'm not gonna know how to do this I don't have a computer you know I'm gonna be doing this on my phone I'm gonna be looking crazy it was, I was just all over the place you know and then it's like then sometimes hearing other stories and it's like what are you 
Sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's not. Why are you not going to be sorry for? It's a country. <laughs> you ain't going to be sorry for. <laughs> Well, my joke on that one is I'm bilingual country. My mama from Mississippi, my daddy from Tennessee, and I live in Georgia. So, <laughs> but um, you know, it's like you know what what you 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 got everything. So what are you sad about? Or what are you complaining? And that's what people don't you know understand. Like when they say, well, I don't understand why somebody says, you know, thinks that their life is so bad they got to commit suicide, and that's it right there. It's not about things. It's not about things. If it's a if it's something that I'm depressed about that's tangible, mm-hmm. that's okay, because that's normal. Yeah. But when I'm depressed and there's no reason in the world for me to just feel dark, mm-hmm. that's when it's hard, yeah. trying to pull yourself out. You know, like Tessa was saying about, like, you know, you can you can function and you can do this and you can do that. My bedroom looks like, and it's like I look at it, it depresses me, but I, I can't do anything about it. I, I one time had somebody come in and clean for me. I was trying to clean because I was embarrassed for them to yeah. see <laughs> what it looked like for them to get there, you know. And it, it, and you know, on the surface, it looks like, oh yeah, she she got it together. But the simplest thing, you know, just sometimes just getting out of bed, or I can find myself where I get up to like my son's car was down. I was taking him back and forth to work, three thirty in the morning. I could do that. Make sure he's there on time. Wake him up and everything. Get the kids to the bus stop on time. But when it's time for me to do something, you know, like I got up extra early today. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take my shower. I'm going to go ahead and eat, take my meds, you know, get my ice pack so I won't be in pain, you know, uh, got my clothes out and everything. And I still was late. And and, and in the middle of it, it was like it took everything in me not to turn the car around and go back. It's like, no, you're going to go. You're going to go. You know, and I'm like, gosh, you know, and it just, just, just simple stuff like that. It looks rude, but I'm not trying to be rude or inconsiderate of anybody's time. It's just, yeah. it's just unfortunate that that's how it is. But it's nice to find out. I mean, not that I want to see anybody else feel bad either, but I'm not alone. Yeah. Whereas I always thought I was. Um, I, t- I t- took care of my dad. Um, in his last six years, and it's funny because I, I'm always been a free spirit, and everybody was shocked that I was the one because they thought, you know, she's the flighty one. No, but you know, but I got the best heart. But it brought me and my brother really, really close together because he was he was telling me how he admired me, and I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, I always felt bad because like they two of my brothers went in the military, they got out, got their degrees and everything. Me, it's like school. But, and I would feel bad about that, but then who knew? Like, for instance, I was going to school to be a nurse, but school's just not for me. So I'm a nurse's aide, but that's what I, you know, did. But when it came time to take care of my dad, I was the one that stepped in and was like, you know, this is just what you do. Bam, you know, it didn't take no thought. I ain't got to worry about, okay, I need to change my life around or whatever. It's like, this is what you do. And it really brought me and my siblings closer because they admired me that I was able to do that. And I always felt like, well, darn, you know, I don't have the life like everybody else. Been on a job for a thousand years and whatever, you know, but I'm who I am. One of the things that I like that you just said was when you talked about disclosing your mental status to people and being able to say, I have all these great things, but I still deal with depression. And I think that's why a lot of people are afraid to disclose their mental status because if it's not tangible, there's not a tangible reason why it's like people won't, you think people won't believe it until you actually talk to other people that mm-hmm. are dealing with the same situation, mm-hmm. come, to, come together and say, okay, I, I get that I'm not the only one. Mm-hmm. So, Miss Jasmine, so I mean, you mentioned that there are times where like, you're afraid to share your story because of how people will respond. So has, has there been any situations or have there been any situations where you had a negative response to you share or disclosing your mental status to someone? So my mental status stems from sexual abuse. Um, I was raped by a family member when I was five years old, and my parents wasn't there because of military obligations. They were stationed in another country altogether. And I had to live with that person for a year. And I had to endure that for a year. So. At five years old, I realized that people couldn't be trusted. I realized that 
adults aren't protectors and I taught myself how to survive. So for me, I didn't disclose. I just, my mom and I just had a conversation about that a couple of months ago. And I carried this secret all my life. And she never, she just looked at me as a, a rebel, one who didn't like rules. She looked at me as somebody with an attitude and anger problems who always isolated themselves. I stayed in my room 24 seven and I lived inside my head. So for me, disclosure wasn't about, I want you to understand how I feel. It's about, I'm ready to release this burden and be who I'm meant to be. And so it wasn't until I started opening up and disclosing my abuse, that was just the first of many, but that one triggered everything else that has happened in my life. So as soon as start, I started sharing my story, that's when I found the path to help others. And I have boys. Um, I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, and so that was the hardest part because I was raped, not only raped by a male, but I was also molested later on by a male, and my biggest fear was having sons. I, I did not want sons. I did not want to potentially project my pain onto my sons, and I did. I'm not, not going to lie. I did do that for a while, but it wasn't until I divorced and I saw that I was repeating the same patterns I saw in my mom in childhood that I knew I needed to make a change. And if you see my kids now, they're very vocal. They're seven, I got a seven going on 70 and a five going on 15. Um, but they speak about whatever it is that they believe. They don't care if you're gonna listen or if you're not. And so my sons have taught me how to find my voice. And so disclosure for me now looks like I'm telling you my story, but it's not for you, it's for me. Yeah. One of the things like uh, I asked Tessa when we was going through, you know, who was gonna be on the panel and everything, and I asked her, were there any guys that submitted to be on the panel? And she was like, no, and I was like, okay, so I got to be up here alone by myself with all these strong black women. I'm like, it's cool, it's cool. I feel like I can handle my own. But one of the things, like as a, a black male, a gay black male, and growing up in the country in a small town, Raceland, Louisiana, shout out to Sharita from Raceland, <laughs> um, I was molested at around seven, eight years old by two different relatives on two different occasions. Well, it was three, three occasions by two different people, and one was a female, one was male. And I remember as I got older, like around 13, I was so angry at the world. And I couldn't figure out why I was so angry. And then one day I started to think about something and it's like I would replay an incident in my head, but it was like, it was just only in my head. But then I started to realize, wait, it's, it's not just in my head. This actually happened. And at that point, I had no one to talk to. I didn't have no guidance in my life from seven, eight years old up until 25, 28 years old. And all that time I was just by myself in my head, in my own thoughts and angry at the world. And so, you know, I, I, listening to you guys on the panel, we all have our own personal experience in the past that we have been on to get us to this point. But one of the things I want you ladies to always keep in mind, that when we look at a person in their situation, for a second, try not to think about if it's a man or if it's a woman. Just think about this person. Because my situation is similar to your situation. And I'm coming to you in a second because I know we got some of your stories. We all have been in a situation, and as a male, like I said, I didn't have an event like this to come to for somebody to say, it's okay. I've been through it also. And so right now in this moment, it's important that we stop looking at just the physical of, of what this person is, their sex, and look at their trauma and what they've been through. So now, Miss Yanta, I know that we talked about your, your trauma and the, your experiences. How has that impacted your life up until this point? Because I know you said recently, like in the, uh, I can't remember how long ago, but it's recent that you actually had a conversation with a man that actually kind of changed your thoughts on mm -hmm. men in general. So share a little bit about your story and how you're feeling right now. And again, like a little trigger, trigger warning. <laughs> so we're about to talk about some very intense stuff. 
Okay, so just like the other two panelists just said, Jamisha. Me? Bo Bobby. Bobby. I don't know why I can't remember Bobby's name. He's been talking all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was molested too when I was a kid. I wasn't just molested, I was raped. And I was raped, tied up, and abused over and over again with my sister and brother feeling like it was a game. And still, like you said, had to stay in the house a year. And I exposed that to my dad. But constantly after that, because of our trauma as a child, you born into trauma, you continue to live trauma. I was molested and abused throughout my years. But I was like, okay, that's cool. Those are perverts. I'm okay with perverts now because I know that's what perverts do. So I accepted the sexual abuse to me because it was done by older people. And then when I became in the military, I was molested by who was my battle buddy who's supposed to go out into the combat zone with me and protect me while I'm out in the combat zone. He knew I was not interested in him and he abused me, but he was my age. That turned the whole tables around to me because now I'm totally confused. I don't know who to, who to trust and how, where the trust comes from. How old were you at that time? I was probably, we went overseas in 2009. I probably was like 25. Okay. Yeah, I was 25 and I was molested. How old were you in the sixth grade? I'm a, I'm a 17 year old graduate, so I probably was like, what, 10, nine? How old are you in the sixth grade? 12, sixth grade. Um, so I was used to sexual trauma throughout my life. And I used to push it down because I did tell somebody. I told my mom, but my mom, she did what she knew the best. My stepmom, they highly educated people, told my mom all they're gonna do is say she had sex. That's a whole year later. My mom felt like, okay, I believe you. She told me she believed me. I knew she believed me. My dad, on the other hand, he didn't believe me. He told me he didn't believe me. He said, what are you doing now? And I eventually, and I'm saying that to get to this point, of part of my healing is, is that I had to eventually sit down and have a conversation with my father about it because I had to have that conversation because I am a lesbian. And part of my lesbian, I don't disclose a lot of times because people like to say that's my mental health. Mm -hmm. And it's not. I've always liked women since I was six years old. I've known this. I used to sneak books from pornos from my uncle who stayed in the basement. And I know this. I was robbed from me making a choice by someone else. So now it looks like because of that happened, that's why she's this way. Because of this, that's why she got mental illness. So hell, I can't be this way on my own. Everybody else giving me a reason why I have to be who I am. So that confuses you all together. And then you don't know who to talk to. You don't know who to trust because everybody wants to put you in a stigma box. They put you in this placement to make their lives feel better. It's usually for other people to feel better about who you are, not for you to feel better about who you are. If I can put you in this category, I'm comfortable with my life. So I say that because, like you said, a male took who I was from me a long time ago. I was angry at the world. I went through a transition of honism. I didn't like, I figured if, if you're going to do it to me, I'm going to do it to you. Yeah. And I'm going to do it better than you. I'm going to hurt you. And I just was out there hurting people. And I know they say hurt people hurt people, yes. but hurt people don't just hurt people. Hurt people hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. I was hurting myself. I, every single person I've given myself to, they've taken something from me. And I don't realize that until I'm an adult now, that I've given so much energy to someone else in the world to have control over me. And I didn't know that when I was a kid growing up. So when I was going through that, I was like, you know, I'm a Baptist child. I go to church all the time. We raised in a religious backbone. I'm born in Tuskegee, Alabama, raised in Long Island, New York. So God dang it, I'm confused already. <laughs> so I was going to church all the time. and going to church, you can't go to other ways of living. So I started to say, you know what, I'm just going to say everything you told me was supposed to be the right way, but it's always giving me hurt. Let me find things out myself. So I started getting into crystals. I started to understand what energy really is. I understand what um, being in your space is and protecting your space from people. So I went to a shaman and the shaman, he sat there and we was talking. And he asked me a question that I was just like, wow. He's like, what are you as a woman? And I'm like, 
um, Yanti said, what do you want most out of your, li- wor- out of your life? What can you give this world? And I was like, well, if you know, people like, if you say money, yeah, if I have money, I have a better life. If I had people who understood me, I have a better life. And he said, where's your power coming from? And I'm like, my daughter who's 21 is not my daughter. I can't have kids because of that molestation I had. I was not able to have kids. My tubes were scarred, and I couldn't have them. So um, I always had that feeling of mental health where it came back to that now I'm not even a woman. Mm -hmm. So I felt less than even being a woman because I couldn't birth a child like a normal woman to because that's what you're on earth for, right? God put you on earth to birth children. That's what everybody told me, and I couldn't do it. And he sat there in front of me, and he told me, he said, you are a woman with more power than anybody in the world. If we take all the men off the world, you're the only one who can birth something. So he said, even if you can't birth a child physically, you birth life into other people. And with that life into other people, that's what your strength comes from. And that day, I opened up my eyes that a male who took something from me years ago took another male to give it to me, and you thought that was something that I should have known as a woman, that I had the power already in me, but it took a male to tell me that you have the power. Don't allow no one else to take that power from you, because without you, you cannot birth anything into life. We will all die in, in without y'all. So that, that would make me be empowerment to someone else, because someone else had to tell me that I had the power, and it was the person who took it from me. And I say took it because I generalized them all in one category. So I don't look out, they was like, used to say, well, you should hate this male, you should hate that male. I'm not a, I'm not a male hater. Mm-hmm. I love them, I love them very, very much. Yeah. And I do give all of them the, still the same respect, and I still trust in them only because I know if I go down that deep end, I will hate every single body that walks around me and talks to me. And I can't do that because I don't know how to hate. I just truly do not know not how to hate. So, don't turn it off, turn back on. So, when did that happen? When did that man, you know, sow that, <laughs> that into you? In your November life? 2021. So, this recent, this couple yes, months recently. ago. Just recently. So, do you feel like at that point, were you, was that like the beginning of your healing or were you already along your journey of healing? I was along my journey of healing, but so what happened is, is that I, I forgave my stepbrother who did it to me a long time ago. I forgave the ex that I dated who did it to me. I could not get over that young dude overseas who did it to me. Because all I could still think about is, one, how do I tell people I've been multiple, multiple times, been sexually assaulted and abused? Now, yeah, you're hot. You, you put yourself in the wrong position. No, I'm a very intelligent person. I'm, I didn't even start drinking until six years ago. So it was not about drinking. It wasn't about being in the wrong spot. My mom gave me rules about putting your cup down and not drinking after it. So it wasn't me putting myself in the wrong position. I, it was happening to me. And then after that, I was like, why is he out there doing this to someone else? Mm-hmm. So all I could think about is, who else is he doing this to? Yeah. And I kept putting a burden on myself. I kept holding it on myself. So when I finished talking to that gentleman, I knew right then that it was not mine to hold. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, he couldn't have my power and I was giving him all my power still. Mm -hmm. Even though I was healed through it, I still kept going back, reversing back to what he doing now, where he at, who he doing this to, what child he got in his life around him. And I I couldn't get out of that spot. Mm -hmm. But after that, that opened up like, Give him, don't give him that power. Yes, definitely. So, Denisha, you good? <laughs> so, that leads me to what you mentioned, and, you know, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, and you said it earlier, that we need to heal and heal for real. Yes. So, explain how you got to that point where you understood, because I think for me, at a young age, I, the first time I went to therapy, I was about 19, I was like, okay, I'm gonna sit through these 45 minutes, but this isn't for me. Then Mm -hmm. I went again Mm -hmm. and being transparent, I saw a um, a white female therapist and I was just like, "Mm, no thank you. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to find a therapist. The first therapist (coughs) that I opened up to was a um, a white male. And this was, ironically, it was in Iraq while I was uh, deployed. And I was just going through so much in that. At one point in my life, I just said, you know what? I don't care who you are, everything that's on the inside of me right now, it has to come out. Right. Otherwise, I'm not gonna make it home, mm-hmm. at least not alive. So I, like, I finally got to that point where I opened up, mm-hmm. 
but I feel like that was the beginning of my healing. And what I used to always, like an uh, um, analogy I would always use is, or a metaphor, God will put us on a plank. And when we're on that plank, when we get to the end, we think that's it. Like, oh, Lord Jesus, I, I don't know how much more I can do. And then out of nowhere, he extends that plank a little bit more for us to keep on walking. And I, I started telling my, myself that because I would always think I've gone to therapy, I've done the work, I'm feeling great, I'm good, I'm healed. But then when something else will pop up, I'm like, oh, Jesus, why, why am I back in the same situation? Why am I feeling the same emotion that I feel, felt a year ago when I thought I was healed? But then I realized I wasn't doing enough to make sure, like I, like I mentioned earlier, it's like we're hitting the surface. Mm -hmm. And in order to get to true healing, we have to break through that surface mm -hmm. and go down deep enough mm -hmm. to figure out what's really causing that. Right. So tell me a little bit about how you got to the point where you understood that you needed to heal and heal for real. Getting to that point, it was definitely a process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have a 25-year-old son. So at the age of 14 is when I was raped, and a product of that is my son. And so it wasn't until I believe it was maybe two or three years ago, two of the ladies in the room were actually in the event where I shared that story about being raped, and a product of that was my son. And I didn't even realize I had shared it at that moment. And I remember one of the young ladies said to me, it's like when you shared it, you got naked up there in front of everybody. And at that moment, I had to make a decision that all this time I walked around and say, I'm okay, I'm healed. But remind you, for 23 years, no one even knew that my son was a product of me being raped. And so it was, okay, I'm going to go to church. Maybe if I get saved, you know, that means I'm healed from what I'm going through. But even in going to church, it um, don't take away from, you know, helping me through the process. But my true healing didn't come until, one, I accepted the fact that I need help. And I made the decision to go sit on the big comfy couch. And when I got there, it wasn't no couch there. Either. It wasn't no couch there. <laughs> but nevertheless, I made a decision almost three years ago to go and talk to someone. And I say, okay, God, if I'm going to be on this healing journey, I need you to do the spiritual portion. But I got to face this thing in the natural. And when facing it in the natural, you know, um, I didn't understand that I had to go brain not just that 14 year old girl, but I had to go brain the five year old girl, the seven year old girl. I had to bring her to me at that age and realize that, hey, I love you no matter what you've been through. And those were some of the things that I learned throughout my healing process that you sometimes have to go back and get that young girl that it happened to or that young boy that it happened to. Bring them to where you are now and treat them how you would have wanted them to be treated when you were younger, that younger yourself. And so even in that, I went through my therapy process for the natural portion of it, but I began to increase my walk with God for the spiritual portion of it. And I can truly say that I see before you today and I'm healed and I'm healed for real because I no longer allow that trauma to traumatize me with moving forward now every day is definitely my healing doesn't look like your healing your healing doesn't look like my healing so however every day I deal with that I address that when it does try to come up I address it so again you know that's my thing being healed and healed for real don't let anyone make you feel like you cannot go sit on the big comfy couch don't let in and, and this is nothing to the church because i am a believer hands down but we don't talk about this enough even coming here when i just thinking about mental illness oh my god i felt like i was being diagnosed all over again with a mental illness and when we hear that word mental illness we immediately think crazy mental illness is not crazy and again, you know, just my healing process and being healed and healed for real. I took the spiritual aspect, but I also knew that it was someone in the natural that needed to help me also. And God has lined those people up for us again to go sit on the big comfy couch. See, a lot of times, like you say, when, you know, we healed and we think we healed and we're afraid to say, okay, I need to go back to that, that big comfy couch. And I remember I was posting on uh, TikTok and I was talking about the event and somebody commented and he said that sometimes it's okay to get a tune-up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes, that is absolutely yes. right. And I think we need to encourage people to say, you know, once you, even when you're feeling good, mm -hmm. sometimes when, when you're in a good mood and things are going the way that you want to, go sit down and talk about that. Because as the devil will come when you're doing your best. 
and we are going towards the goal that you need to reach in life, that's when the devil comes in. And I don't know, for those of you who, who follow me on Instagram and TikTok, I love Fantasia Barina. And a plug for Fantasia, you know she's going to be in the color purple, right? Y'all know that. <laughs> so she said she was doing an interview at T.D. Jake's church, and she said that when she found out that she had the part, she went to the church and she went pray at the church so that she could suit up for the war that was about to come. And I think like with, like I, I, my, my partner will tell you this morning, I had my gospel music playing. When I came in here, I had my, my earbuds in, but I said, no, I need to let this play out loud so everybody can hear. And people started singing the songs and things like that. And I think that that's important that we share that, that with people. So Ms. Tessa, when did you realize that there was something wrong? And what was your healing process like? I um, realized something was wrong with me when I snapped on my mother. Yes. And to this day, it still bothers me. Mm -hmm. I believe it was um, in 2014. Now, um, about 10 months prior to that, I had lost my auntie. Um, and that's when they said, you need to see uh, a psychiatrist. But even then, I kept pressing, kept pressing. I didn't pay it no mind. I didn't, I didn't um, think that something was wrong, you know? But when I snapped on my mother, <laughs> I knew that something was not right. Something that altered, altered my thinking and, and altered my ability to, to um, be able to react responsibly. And so, um, of course, they started me on, um, I was going to, so I have PTSD. And before they realized I had PTSD or confirmed it, they said that I was dealing with a major depressive disorder because uh, I stayed in isolation a lot. And um, so um, when they realized that it was something deeper than that, they put me on, um, I, was, I was going to, uh, what is it called, it's severe, um, trauma therapy, and I was doing it twice a week. I had to do that for like 12 weeks. And so even still, I really wasn't focused on what I was going there for. I was too busy to focused on work and climbing the ladder and doing and going for everybody else. And so um, I think in 2000, well, 2017, that's, you know, I, earlier I said, you know, the frustration came when um, every time I got around somebody and, and I would feel anxious or I'm exhausted because I haven't been sleepy and so now I'm irritable, but I know I have to perform and I have to perform well uh, because that's how I've set myself up. I have very high standards and that's not good, y'all. And so um, I, I was up one morning about three o'clock and I uh, drew this design. Uh, I think Marquita has on the shirt, understand what you can't see, because I was wondering why people don't understand um, what we're going through. A few people at work knew I had PTSD, and a, and a few people found out because they saw, you know, how I responded to just the slightest of noises. And then there was some who knew that I was struggling, but because I looked good, and I was performing well, they just couldn't wrap their mind around, it can't be nothing wrong with you. you you're still doing the same thing. And so in 2018, uh, it was the last Saturday in January, I was in my bedroom and um, my linen, which was white and with, a gray, with one gray trimming on it, was just as gray as that gray trim because that was my um, safe space for weeks after week. I would just go to work, come back home to that bedroom. And so that Saturday morning, it was like a light just beamed on me. And um, it said, no more. You've got to come out of this. And you got to find a way. And so I started to ask myself questions. I started coaching myself. You know, why are you feeling this way? 
why when you think about this, you feel this way? And then I started paying more attention to myself and, and trying to identify my triggers. You can't fix something that you don't know what it is. And so a lot of times you have to take time and go within yourself. And that's what we don't do a lot of. And so uh, from there, uh, my journey of heal healing started with just getting to know myself. And so I started, um, I started doing a, like little personality assessments. And then I, um, I think a few months after that, well, a few weeks after that, I went to uh, a leadership training. It was three weeks. And I was just so engaged and, and into it, and we did the MBTI uh, personality assessment. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it so much till I came back and I actually got certified as a practitioner. But um, I began to um, test my growth in just those few months when my brother passed suddenly on uh, Easter morning, 2018. And initially I had vowed that um, I wasn't going to go to Mississippi and just be and do like I did, you know, with my dad. I said, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait until they say they need me to come and let me know when the thing was. But I couldn't do that. But I did try to, make, you know, I, I, I paid attention to what I was doing and then I tried to curtail it a little bit. Okay, you got to rest. So I made sure that I, I made time to rest just a little bit and keep going, keep going. So that was my test. And that's what we have to do. Recovery for us is continuous. And you have to pay attention to yourself and then set the intention to, to say, look, if this is happening, then what's making it happen? And then what can I do to change it? What can I do? And every time it's not going to be the same time. It's not going to be the same thing. It's going to be a different thing, a different solution every time for, different, for, a, diff for, that, for a different problem. And so, that's when I, I really got engaged in trying to, you know, test myself. I started coming out of my four walls. Uh, 2019, I started going out more uh, with other people because I promised you I would not go nowhere. I barely went home. Uh, I just went to work and I went, I traveled for work and, and that was it. And then I decided, I said, well, you know what? I want to open up a resiliency center. And so my, my, uh, I noticed that a passion started to rise up in me. Uh, every time I would get around somebody, I, I, I was, it was all, always about uh, bouncing back, bouncing back. Yeah, this happened to you, but what can you do to move forward? My mantra is adapt, adjust, and overcome. And that's what I tell myself, adapt, adjust, and overcome. Adversities are gonna happen as long as we're living. And we have to find a way to keep moving forward. So now, anytime something happens, no matter how bad it is, that's what I say, adapt, adjust, and overcome. And then I try to figure out what can I do to keep moving forward? What can I do to help the people around me keep moving forward? Cool, nice. So I have a question for Jasmine. With your boys, how did you get to the point where you was able to say, okay, now it's time for me to heal for real? Like I have a, a friend of mine that I had a conversation with her a couple of years ago, and when she had a daughter, her daughter became her life. Everything was about her daughter, and I was like, at some point you have to say, what about me? Mm -hmm. Take time for you, do something for you, and I was like encouraging her, like find a babysitter, go out for two hours, and even if you don't have plans to do anything, just take time for you. So what was, it, what was your journey like going towards your healing, and how did that look like for you? I think for me, it started before I had kids. So it started seeing my mom as a mom. And my mom has always been resilient. She's um, retired military, specifically Army. So she's always had this strong outer appearance. And she would tell me, um, try to prepare me for motherhood. So her thing was when you become a mother, for the next 18 years, you give up your entire life. And so me, being the rebel child that I was, I'm like, well, why would I give up 18 years of my life for somebody that's 
you know, going to go off and start on their own life. And then what am I going to do after? I'm not, I would rather not have kids or even in my relation, like my love life, I would rather be single than to give up something that I want for the sake of another person. So that carried on to motherhood. So when I had my first Aiden, who's, that boy is just so loving y'all, y'all would love him. <laughs> Aiden um, is my kids show me the real me. Aiden is the loving, the nurturing, um, the sensitive side of me. And Jaden, who's my youngest, is the rough, the oh my God, brutally honest, <laughs> um, aggressive side, but protective. And so when I had Aiden, for me, it was about learning how to love. Aiden, and his name means little fire, but he taught me what love truly was. And because of the love that he showed me, I was able to give it to myself. And with Jaden, Jaden taught me because we had so many traumatic experiences um, just during the pregnancy and the birth alone. We both almost lost our lives um, within the span of the week after he was born. So for me, he taught me what it was like to fight. And so, I never forget it. Um, I just moved into my apartment. My divorce was final June 19th, ironically, 2017. And I saw the kids playing. And that day, I got a text that I didn't want to respond to about the divorce. And I just looked at my kids. And I, they wanted me to play. And I didn't want to play. I was angry. I wanted to be left alone. And then I remember times where my mom had a hard day or just was in a bad mood and how she would lock herself in her room and not interact with us. And that's when I realized that I wanted more for my kids. I wanted, I didn't want to be the hurting parent anymore. I didn't want to show them that I was angry all the time. And they would ask, mommy, why are you angry? Why are you sad? And I would be like, I'm not sad, I'm okay. You know, mommy's fine. But I was lying to them and I was teaching them subconsciously to suppress how you feel in order to be okay. And so that moment forced me to heal. And it made, it had me to make a decision that regardless whether I'm okay or not, they're gonna see me struggle, they're gonna see me happy, they're gonna see me hurting, and they're gonna be a part, of, a part of the process as I'm healing. Because when they get older, I don't want them, like I tell um, my clients, I give my children a childhood that they do not have to spend their adulthood healing from. So when things come up, we deal with it, we process it, we move on. If I am having a manic depressive state and I'm on the go, they're right there with me. If I'm having a depressive state and I'm in the bed and they ask me, are you okay? No, mommy's just sad, but mommy's gonna be fine. If I'm not getting out the bed, mommy's tired, but if you wanna get in the bed with me, bring the snacks, bring the blankets, we can watch movies, but we're not gonna go out today. And so that I believe has built resilience, compassion and understanding in them. So now when they see people out in public who may not look like they should be happy, they'll say something nice or they'll wave or they'll smile because they know. So that's, that's definitely been helpful for my healing journey. And see, I think that that's important for the world because that little act of kindness, especially like from a kid, mm -hmm. you, could be, you could be pissed off at the world, but a little kid wave at you, you can't help but to smile and wave <laughs> back. Right. You know, I think that that's important and we need more people like that because you have, like you said, you mentioned you had um, the separation anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that when being able to heal from that, and breaking that chain is setting them up for success in their future. Because I think so many people don't heal from that. Like my father left um, when I was about three years old. And I remember there was like a little, it was like a round thing that goes at the bottom of one of those old mic stands. And it was really, really heavy. And it was in my mom's room and I, we used to prop the door open to hold the door open. And as a kid, I remember it being there, but I didn't know what it was. And as I got older, I started to remember, I'm like, okay, this goes to a mic stand, 
Then I could remember a piano being at the end of my mom's bed. I'm like, okay, this belongs to my dad. There was some de- uh, two or three cans of deodorant in the drawer. And I'm like, why is this stuff here? But he's not here. Then I start to remember, at one point, he was here. And as a kid, I was saying, well, maybe, maybe he left because of me. Then as I realized, figured out who I was, my sexuality, and the first I'm like, maybe if he was here, I wouldn't be gay. Maybe if he was here, I wouldn't have had the experiences that I've had, and my life would be better. And as I got older, I started to realize that who I am as a person is contributed to him, contributed to him not being here. Because if he was there, who say I would have been here to have this conversation right now? Who, who say, who's to say that I would be finishing my master's program if he was here? What path would I have gone down if he was still in my life? So for that, I'm able to say thank you to him for helping me become the man I am for not being a part of my life. Um, right now, we're going to watch a clip from the Soldier's Wife stage play, which was written and directed by a very handsome young man by the name of Jarrell Bobby Brown. <laughs> Some of y'all might know him. All right, so can we play Ralph? Whatever it is you're dealing with, bro, talk to me, man. You don't have to do this alone. I've been alone for the last two years. Jay, what the hell does that mean? I watched two of my soldiers die right in front of me. And there wasn't a damn thing I could do about it. So, I had to get up every day and stand in front of my company and say, be strong because we're soldiers. Specialist Jordan, Sergeant Blackie, I was their commander. I was supposed to protect them, but I couldn't. Will you do anything? Anything, whatever you want, whatever you want, I promise you. Okay, I'll stay. Baby, I'm, I, I, I'm under, under so one much. condition. Whatever you want. Get some professional help. <laughs> Baby, I, I don't need help. We, we, we can work through this together. We just. We... No, 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 we can't. And if you won't get help, I, I want a divorce. Wait, 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 what do you, what do you need a divorce? Baby, please, no, 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 no. I have already talked to a lawyer, and I will have him come take No, please, 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 I, please, please, if, 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 if you love me, you, you, you will stay, please, if you love me, I'm out, I'm sorry. This, no, please. That's the problem. That's the problem right there. I do love you. But my love, baby, is not enough to fix this. I can't do this alone. Oh, no, wait, wait, we, we all we gotta do. Ready, Renee! Yeah, yeah! Talk to me, man. Why did you try to hurt yourself? Because I'm tired, man. I'm tired of having to fight every single day of my life. I can't do it. You, 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 you. I don't want to hurt my family. I don't. I don't. But I can't keep going through life smiling like everything is okay. Like everything is good. But that's how we're supposed to do because we soldiers. We men. We just take it and we just deal through life like everybody else did. But I don't know. I I I I I I, I want to be strong. I feel like I'm dying inside. Look at me. I can't. I can't. Look at me, Jay. I can't, man. You don't have to do this alone. Do you hear me? You don't have to do it alone, bro. I'm here for you. No, I'm helping you, right? Yeah. Brother, let me just help you, okay? Yeah. Okay? I love you, bro. I, I love you too, bro. <laughs> All right. So, I wrote this play back in 2015, 16, and it took me a while to get up the money and the nerve and the courage to actually put the play on. The reason why I did it is because when I got out of the military, I felt all alone, and I didn't have anyone to talk to. I couldn't talk about anything that I 
went through because I felt like I felt like if I shared some of those things and being a soldier, like it made me weak if I said that I, I suffered through this time and being in Iraq and and being on on base and having rockets launched at you is like how can you tell your family members that like how can you say this is what I experienced and now these are the aftermath the aftermath of everything that I experienced and the emotions that I'm dealing with and holding on to to now and trying to get past that and so as a, a writer and actor it's like okay let me be creative and put this on stage to entertain other people but also being true to who I am and telling some of my story and the thing that I that I got from the response I got from the show it let me know that I did something right. And it also helped me to understand that there are so many people that have been in the military years, did 20 years, retired from the military, that are also struggling in silence. And it's like, how can we bridge this gap? So as we continue this conversation, I think it's important for us to remember that there's a lot of trauma that even as we sit here today, we haven't shared every single thing. I don't think there's enough time in, a, in, in a, a month, in a year, to sit down and talk about everything that we've been through. So when we talk, like Domitia, we were talking about the healing and everything, and healing for real. So I have a question for Ms. Jermisa. So what has your healing process been like for you? And at what point in your life did you realize that there was something wrong and that you needed to make a change? I, um... The point in my life when I realized that something was wrong when I was a little girl and everybody kept telling me something was wrong. I hadn't even developed yet. But you're crazy. It started by the age of six. I was sexually, mentally, physically, and emotionally abused for a long time time in life. Those were not the pointers for me. I could deal with that because it had happened so much that I built an immune system again against it. What really, really boggled me was being a black sheep of the family to no cause or no fault of your own. That was projected by colorism. That's why equality is something that I voice my voice, use my voice for more than anything. Colorism affected me in the way until now I literally do not have anything to do with majority of my family members. I am 52, I will be 52 years in, in May. I have been close to my family for over 50 years. Whenever they had functions, I was, if nobody else showed up, I showed up for everything, ever since I was that little girl. When COVID first came, <clears throat> my family silenced me in the family texts. They didn't want to talk to me. They would chee chi and ha-ha with each other, but whenever I would say something, only the males in my family would respond. The women, no. They wouldn't respond. I would call people. These are people I've been knowing all my life. These are people that I have looked up to. We call them, they wouldn't answer the phone. They wouldn't do nothing. And that's because I had found my voice. But the minute when you find your voice, it's a problem. Because remember, you're the black sheep. You're supposed to be underneath everybody else. You not supposed to know who you are. You are supposed to be who we say you are. And right now, you're not acting right. You got a mind of your own. You're not acting right. I had an aunt, and we were texting. And they asked about my grandfather, and one of my aunts wanted to know uh, if anybody had a recording of my grandfather preaching. 
And one of my cousins on Facebook had posted and I shared it in the group and said, here it is. Well, they had developed another text group and I wasn't a part of it. So one of my cousins, she went under that cousins on Facebook and asked him, was that my granddad? I said, what? I've been going to church with this man all my life. I'm there in the video with him. Y'all can't respond back to me, the one that shared the information with you. So she, being who she is, oh, we know, we're discussing. I'm like, where are y'all discussing it? Because I don't see this. So that's when I realized that they got a text. After 50 years, I've been waiting for my Tina Turner moment for a long time to bust out the back of that limousine. And I did. I wasn't disrespectful. I told him, I said, y'all been doing this my whole life, ever since I can remember. I am a grown woman. Something that obviously, no matter how old you are, 75 and 72, you hadn't made it to where I am yet. I had to tell my aunts this. I'm a grown woman. You know what one of my aunts said in response to that text? Misa, I don't know what you're going through and I don't care. I've been knowing these people. Oh. When I say all oh, my life, and you know, what I told them was, it's not that I don't love y'all. Don't get that wrong. I don't have no ill will towards you. But it's time for me to say my peace and move on. Because it's one thing for you to do it to me. Then there's another thing for you to try to attack my children. But when you try to attack my children, you get too close to my grandchildren. And one thing about it, my grandchildren are going to have a future, whether you like it or not. So I got to, I got to, cut the line off. So what, what things have you done since you know, disconnecting from the family? What things have you done to make sure that you are in a good space? Maybe? That's one thing about the good Lord up above. When one door closes, another and opens. He puts his children in a realm. And when you're on your good foot, you can march to that beat. And when one door closes, it's true. Another door's door opens. I still have a relationship with my children. My oldest daughter was here. I don't know. She done left. But um, I have a husband, his family in Rome. Now, my husband ain't perfect, y'all. When you open up the Bible and you see foolish man, that's what I married. But he ain't gonna let nobody do nothing to me. He ain't gonna let nobody make me feel. He ain't gonna do that. So I walk around wrong, riding public transportation, everything, and just keep on going and don't know nobody there, but I do me and I don't have no problems. He delivered me from one place to the next. So, I wake up every morning, I open my blinds with the seasonal affective disorder, I have to have sunshine. I open my blinds every day. The neighbors don't know no better, they think I'm opening my blinds every day to see them. <laughs> I gotta deal with them. But I open my blinds every day, I watch my Joyce Myers, Every Sunday morning, I play my Mississippi Mass Choir for about four or five hours. I live right next door to Walmart, and my daughter said, I don't know who thought it was a good idea to move you next door to a store. And I said, somebody that knows me very well. I go to Walmart. Everything was in 0 0.3 miles of me, including my bank. I live a beautiful life. So I have, okay. 
I went to, I was seeing my therapist at the beginning of last year, and one of the things, like you said, open up your blinds. Um, my therapist said when we look at our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors, and sometimes when you think something, you start to feel a certain way after you start those, those thoughts come in, and then the behaviors begin to follow, and if you're thinking negative thoughts and you'll feel negative, you're going to do negative behaviors, right? And so she was like, you need to intervene somewhere along this chain in order to break that chain. And one of the things she said, go sit outside. If you don't sit outside for five minutes in the sunlight, go for a walk, go ride the bike, light up your favorite candle. One of the things I like doing, I like doing karaoke. So sometimes I'll be in the house just doing karaoke. The other day, I, somebody was knocking on the door and I'm up there doing karaoke. I was like, you ain't called first? So I'm doing my karaoke, you're not about to disturb me. But I think that it's important to do those small things that make you happy. And like, like you said, like your kids walking up to somebody and, and saying hey to them, like those small things kind of change the feelings and the thoughts and the behaviors that kind of put us on a different path. And my, my therapist, she was a black female. I love that lady. Like I, I, I knew I had to stop going to therapy after so long because it was only like six months of going. But I wanted, she was leaving the company. I wanted to go with her wherever she was going. <laughs> I was like, They're gonna, that might be a little unprofessional, so I ain't going to do that. Uh -huh. But I have a question for you, you, all of you in the audience if you want to share. Just raise your hand. How many of you have actually been to therapy? Good. That's not awesome. I want everybody to raise their hand. <laughs> I'm thankful for those of you who have gone because like the fact that we're here and we're having this conversation and for me, one of the biggest things that I'll say is go to therapy. Even if, if you feel nothing is wrong, go to therapy and tell them nothing's wrong, but work making you mad, my, my partner making me mad, my cousin made me mad, and talk about it. Because after so long, that begins to build up inside, and we don't want to wait till you need therapy. You go before you need it, and you work on those things before it gets there. So Ms. Kimberly, I know you want to share something related to therapy. Yeah, um, to piggyback off of that, make sure, and you may, the first therapist that you connect with may not be the fit therapist for you. That's okay, same way with meds. You know, I was on, probably 20 plus before they finally got the right concoction for me. But it's so important that you feel comfortable talking to your therapist, because if you don't, you won't share. I remember when they first um, <laughs> sent me to the therapist and I was thinking, I ain't telling her nothing. I don't know what they sending me for. And it was like, I was so comfortable with her. It was like she had poured truth serum on me and I still have her to this day. Like you said, she left, she left the company. She, she retired from VA. Of course, you know, in initially she couldn't just take us. Yeah. Not that I could afford to do it anyway, but after having a thousand more that I never connected with, it was like, you know what? I'm going to have to budget this in just like my mortgage. And that's what I do. I pay out of pocket because I'm comfortable with her. I see her every two weeks. Well, we're on the phone. I'll be glad we get back in person, but we're on the phone. But every two weeks. And sometimes, you know, when I'm okay, she'll say, so do you want to make an appointment for the next two weeks? I'm like, yeah, that's how I stay this way. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because even when I, you know, and sometimes, you know, I feel like, oh, okay, I'm okay. But I still know that I need to talk to somebody that's impartial, that's not judging, that's not going to tell me how to do this, you know, or, or, we, or, or I'm not going to share because I don't want you to think, you know, you can just, you can really just be. So it's very important that, you connect with the therapist. And if you don't connect with that one, that's okay, find another one. There are plenty of them out there. I find, for me, it's better that um, I have someone of color because I feel like we understand each other a little different. That's not to say that we all had the same walk of life or anything, but, you know, it's a difference. You're not talking to me, uh, this sounds good on paper. Like, I've done the mindfulness. I've done, you know, all those different classes and different stuff, and it's like, yeah, that sounds good, but when you're in it, you can't necessarily think, okay, well, I need to handle this this way, you know. You can think about it later on and say, oh, wow, this is what this was talking about. But they tend to go by the book as opposed to real life. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the main thing I say, just make sure you're comfortable with that person. And that way you can get something out of it. Because if you're not comfortable with that person, you're not going to share. You're not going to get, you'll think, well, I'm just going. I went, you know, nothing to it. But if you get somebody that you're really, really comfortable with, it, it'll make a difference in your life. Yeah, I think it's, it's important because like, it's like a cultural thing. So when there's like a cultural difference, and you talk that's about That's what I was trying to say, yes. Like that's connected to like family and church and things like that. Some people just don't connect.
connect. Yeah. Like, okay, don't go to church. It was like, hold oh, on. I was <laughs> taught this. This is what I was taught. This is what I was brought up in. Yeah. You're telling me, mm-hmm. oh, let's just stop it. I had a therapist tell me, well, uh, well, if you're not going to talk, then what do you come for? And it's like, because you need to see what I'm like on my bad days. Yeah. I had, um, you know, I would come in and it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm almost like, my analogy of it is a little kid, you know, you say, well, how was school today? Oh, it was great. You know, so I'm telling you this, but then, but then as soon as I leave out of there, I'm feeling like I just want to die because I'm just sad. And it's like, I didn't tell you anything that I really needed to tell you because you don't make me feel like I can share with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I leave here and, and the walls go close back in on me, you know, so. So Jasmine, I know you said that you've been to one therapist, right? So what's the reservation with going to a different therapist? Well, for me, um, my mom's a counselor. Okay. Um, so I've always had her as a resource, but um, I'm a preacher's kid. And then my godparents are preachers, so I grew around a whole bunch of pastors. Um, Therapy didn't work for me in the sense of they were only, when I went, because I've tried different types of therapy, not just one, but each one that I went to, and I waited until after, like you said, after it was already too late. 20 years had passed, and I'm now a 20 at the time, 23 year old, dealing with something that happened when I was five. I should have dealt with it at five so that the 23, the 16, the 10 year old me wasn't carrying that weight and adding more baggage onto something that was already heavy. So for me, the aspect of therapy didn't work in that. Um, And I was on medication and I didn't like the way it felt. I didn't like being numb. I was already numb. So what's the whole point of feeling numb again? And if you ever listen to the commercials, they tell you antidepressants can cause suicidal thoughts. And I was already having suicidal thoughts. So for me, it was more of what actually works in my real day life. When I am experiencing a traumatic event, when I'm triggered, when I'm depressed, and I cannot sit down on the phone and talk to you, or I cannot take my medication, what can I do in lieu of that can work? And what can I continue with that? Um, One thing I've learned, and the reason why I didn't want to be a therapist and I wanted to be a coach is because when you go to a therapist, you're dealing with that problem. If you go to a therapist about depression, you're going to talk about depression unless you have one that you connect with on a personal level that is invested in you long term. They're there to do a job based off of the education that they receive. So if I'm telling you I'm depressed and all you want to know is how you can cover up my depression and help me get through the day you're not helping me fix my issues you're only medicating me so that you can get paid Mm -hmm. and that's the part that i didn't like about therapy so when i decided that i wanted to heal what was practical what was real what can i tell a parent a single parent with two boys who's owning business going to school working a nine to five dealing with a divorce and having these triggers from their childhood, what can I tell them in that moment that can work? And for me, it was different, a variety of things. It was diet. Um, It was what I was feeding into my body as well as what I was watching, what I was listening to, the people I was surrounded by. So the first thing I had to do for me was sever ties with people that were not invested in my personal growth. And once I did that, I started noticing patterns in those people why were i attached to you because you fed the trauma you fed the lies and it wasn't lies but it was it wasn't my truth it was your truth because you were hurting you connected to my hurt and my hurt made you feel better about your hurt so you didn't care about me you cared that i was a band-aid to a wound that you refused to heal and so that's what was most important to me and it did take mindfulness because so a man speaketh or and thinketh, so is he. So I had to reprogram myself to think highly of myself. Um, even now, you'll see if you come in my bedroom on my mirror, 
At first, I had I am enough because I didn't feel worthy enough. When I wanted to start a business, my mom tried to talk me out of starting my business. My mom laughed at me when I told her I wanted to be a coach and quit my corporate job in accounting. And so I was fighting against other people's fears as well as my own. So I had to start writing so I could visualize and see that I am good enough. And after I saw that I was good enough and I started believing I was good enough, then it's I will be successful. And the next thing I am love and so on and so forth until I believe it. But visualization is most important, especially when you're dealing with depression and you feel like you cannot get out of that state. And in that moment, all you think is woe is me. And you're right. Be in that moment, but don't stay there. What was you today? But my, 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 how tomorrow is going to be better. And so things like that is what's helped me cope with my depression um, and my prognosis and diagnosis without the need of therapy as well as medication. You know, one of the things I would always tell myself, so like with depression, is like going on a vacation. You're going to go for two or three days. You can have your bags, like I'm in, we're in a hotel now, like most of the stuff's still in the bag. So when, I, when I'm in that depression state, depression state, I'm on vacation. It's okay for me to be there, but I'm not gonna unpack my bags and I'm not gonna stay there. So I know that in two, three days, I need to get back up and keep moving. And I had to always, I had to remind myself that it's okay to have those down days. It is okay to be sad. It is okay to be frustrated, as long as you don't let that become your new normal. And that's something that I've been working on a lot. So, Tessa telling me we got to wrap up, because it's time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to, but we got to, we got to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. y'all want to say something? Sure, go, go on, go on. Up. Um, I mentioned this when we were having a sidebar conversation, even with going to therapy, for those of us that do choose to go, don't go in there and tell the therapist how to treat you. <laughs> I'm guilty of it. I went in there and I'm paying this lady and I'm telling her what to do for me. Oh. Like she would say, you know, what's wrong? I tell her what's wrong. I said, oh, but this is what I'm going to do to fix it. And I, I mean, and that's so important to be able to identify because what it is, we get so accustomed and so comfortable with covering up and trying to fix what we think we can fix where when the real help is there we're trying to tell the real help how to fix us and i'm telling i would go in there and tell that lady oh today x y and z happened but this is what i'm gonna do to fix x y and z and she looking at me like so you just paid me all this money to tell me what you're gonna do to fix yourself so not only am i wasting money i'm wasting money her time and my time so yeah even if, if therapy is the route that you do decide to go and prayerfully those of us that, that can take upon that therapy route we'll go that route go and just be willing to sit and listen and take the tools that the therapists have for you um and don't be afraid to jump around from therapist to therapist some people say oh well, you need to be consistent and plan it here he don't work for me she don't work for me next. because everybody yeah next, next. <laughs> the end next but go get the help the help is there and don't go try to be the help like i'm i'm just guilty of it <laughs> Um, I just want to say, just listen to all of us. We all have different type of therapy experiences. And with that different type of ther therapy experiences, it's come from our personality. So it's finding the right match for you. I have had a black um, therapist. Didn't work for me. She was too perfect. And I was too far perfect. So she was too perfect. And she wouldn't open up to me. And I couldn't open up to her because she was too put together. So I tried to explain that to her. But she was the one who had to go by the books. Every single time I walked in there, here's this page we have to go over, this, this page we have to go over. So she wasn't listening to me and what I needed at that moment. And I told her, it's okay that we go through the book, but right now I need emergency assistance. Mm -hmm. She couldn't give it to me. So I had to advocate for another person. They thought because I was gay, a gay person would be fun for me. <laughs> no. She just kept pushing pamphlets on me to go participate in other stuff. <laughs> I live a normal life. <laughs> I enjoy everybody. So don't push that on me. That's not my life to be pushed on me. So then I had to advocate for another therapist. 
And the, f the therapist I got now, she's a white therapist. However, I had to have a conversation with her too because I talk strong. I am a black woman. And so I'm going through these coaches that we do and I'm learning the tools, cognitive learning. You get your tools, you gotta talk, you feel your feelings, you gotta express yourself. And I'm expressing myself <clears throat> in her. And it got to a day I had to say, you gave me all these tools, but you're not letting me use them. I'm telling you what I want, but when I say something, you think I'm angry at you. I'm not. I'm expressing myself. And not till she came back to the next meeting, she said, you know what? I was blind. I did not hear you. And I did not understand you. I, myself, was scared because you were a black woman. And I didn't know how to address you as a black woman. And so I didn't want to upset you by what I said, where I couldn't be a, a good counselor for you. From that conversation that we had, it has been amazing. Because now she was able to open up her fear of dealing with me as a black woman, and I was able to express my fear of her as a white woman not being able to understand where I was coming from. So she gives me things, she always tried to give me things related, but she gives me things that give me value because she is actually learning the same things that we do. And then she is understanding where we come from. And so now we're able to talk in our therapy sessions. So now I can have a connection with her. So when I'm feeling bad and I have to just go off the end and cuss and all that other stuff, she don't feel like I'm coming at her. She don't feel like I'm mad at her. But she actually listens to me and she gives me thoughtful and I actually get to take control of my counseling session. I don't go by no book in my counseling session. I know I'm at a VA and she probably get five if they find out but she does not go by the book she goes about well, how is Johnson to feeling today what do we need to work on today where are you feeling these emotions from is this something that's going on and she'll send me an email to check on me even when I have a break to say hey I know you're going through a transition like even I just retired this is my one week for retirement from the military oh, hey. <laughs> thank you <laughs> but she sent me an email to say how's your transitioning going to have a counselor beside you to do that, and that's my point of this, is to have someone else when you can't go nowhere else. Yes, my friends and them are glad, but the thing is is that I ain't opened up to them like I opened up to her. She don't have to check on me, but she choose to check on me. So they feel obligated at times to check on me. So it's a difference. So just know that our process is different than everybody's process. Our tools is different. I talk to my ancestors every day, probably twice a day. I literally have an altar. I bless my ancestors. I give them some liquor and wine too, so they could be happy. Because <laughs> my mama was a drinker. <laughs> so I talk to them every day, but I go to my knees. I talk to my God every day. And different throughout the day, I am a Buddhist. I, I represent Buddhism. I'm not, that is not my religion. My religion, I'm a Baptist down south girl. I'm country as I don't know what. But I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, but I do take other people's religions that give me joy and pleasure in life. So I'm not doing anything outside of it because I put him above everything, but I do choose those tools that make me happy. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is choose the tools that give you peace in life, that allow you to go get the help when you need to help, or go talk to somebody when you need to talk to somebody. Because Tess is my rock. I call her and say all kinds of crazy stuff to her. She, she'll go the heck off on me. I just say, that's Tessa, hang up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do. Tasha be like, you all right? I said, Tessa going off. <laughs> and then a few minutes later, she'll send me something else. There we go. Sometimes I ignore, sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. It's just our relationship. That's because we have learned each other's relationship. Not because I think something's wrong with her. Now, I ask her deeply, are you OK? Yeah. Are you thinking about hurting yourself? No? OK. Then we check on each other. So that's all I'm saying is just, know that you know what you need so that you can better somebody else's yeah. life for what they need. Yeah. Uh, Jamisa, do you have a final thought for us? Yanta mentioned something very important. She said tools. A lot of uh, what we, our gradual is we utilize tools. But the tools that are given to us are based on guidelines, but we're treated with them and we take them and utilize them as an individual. Um, I, um, I think I've gotten past the phase of telling my therapist and my doctor that I think mental illness is just hypersensitivity to BS. Mm. <laughs> um, 
And I think that's probably one of the basic points that I wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah. Just would like to say, as Yanta was talking, um, so all things, some because I just feel it in the room. Some of us may say, Well, I can't get to a therapist, I can't afford a therapist. Find someone you can trust with your vulnerability, find someone that you can truly trust with your vulnerability and begin to talk to them again. Trust them with your vulnerability. If a therapist is not for you, I don't know who that person may be in your life. Find someone that you can trust with your vulnerability and whether you know it or not, being transparent about what you're going through is also a part of your healing process as well. Rem remember, transparency does not mean tell all. You can be transparent, but you don't have to tell everything. But the main point I wanted to make was find someone you can trust with your vulnerability if, is not, if therapy is not for you. Kimberly? I just wanted to say that um, I have learned so much from everybody on this panel. I'm grateful to be a part of it. Um, it it's, it's been amazing, and um, I really have really looked, I have really just really enjoyed listening to everybody and just learning different stuff. Cause like everything that somebody came out with, you know, whether I've gone through that directly, it's something that I can learn something from. So I'm I'm really glad that I was a part of this. Thank you. I just want to say to remember that healing is a journey, not a destination. Um, you only heal one aspect, but you're always healing. Life is about experiences. Learn the experience, glean what you can from it, and move on to the next experience. Um, one person that I look up to, her name is Lulu, she used to tell me, depression is when you're thinking about the past. Anxiety is when you're concerned for the future. But the most important thing about mental health, mental health and mental illness is learning how to live in the present. Embrace what is happening, good, bad, and indifferent, and especially in the black community, we're so focused on surviving. We're so focused on presenting ourselves in a way that people will, outside of our culture, accept us. And it's so sad that our own people are the ones to reject us before anybody else do. And it's a lot of trauma, generational trauma, due to our past that has happened that is continuously affecting us genetically. And if you haven't heard anything from my story, no, just one decision, one action can change future generations to come. So if you take nothing else from today, decide to do something different. Ms. Tessa? Yeah, I'd like to point out a few things. Um, one, if you are uh, dealing with a mental illness. I hope that you see today that you are not alone. Take that with you. Reach out. Um, we'll give you our contact information. Reach out to somebody who is going to be present with you. And what I mean by present, and I'm very adamant about that word, being present, because it's difficult for someone to be vulnerable, right? And um, when they do finally get the courage to be vulnerable and open up to you and then you show them that you don't have time to listen then they're going to shut down so when you see somebody or when somebody approach you and they say um well i had a rough day or i had this going on because most time they're not just going to come out and say well i'm dealing with this right here they're not it, they're going to do it suddenly because they're trying to see if you got time for them. And then they, they make that choice in that split second of whether they're gonna move forward or they're gonna retract. And so I, I, I want you to pay attention to the nonverbal cues. Yeah. You know, pay attention to somebody's mood. Uh, I had a blow up with my uh, therapist. I've been with her almost eight years and we had a big blow up. Well, it wasn't a blow up. I just didn't like the way that um, she was so focused on what she had to do for her job rather than 
listening to what I'm saying and how I'm saying it. And we don't do that enough. Sometimes we got to put the job and everything that we got going on aside and just be there for somebody. And we don't want you to fix us. We just want you to listen. Right? So that's one, two, that was two things. And then the final thing I want you guys to know that everybody dealing with something mm -hmm. every single day. I don't care if you got a text. However you send a message out, let somebody know that I need somebody. Because we do. We all need somebody at some point. And everybody don't know how to ask for help. But, but just, just come up with a way. Like with one of my friends from Houston, uh, I don't care how many times she calls me and I don't answer that phone, she never stops calling me. She gonna leave me a voice message. And she knows that when I don't call her back in a certain amount of time, she knows that I'm in that space. Mm -hmm. And so she, she respects that, but at the same time, she knows, let me continue to let her know that I love her and I'm thinking about her and I'm here for her. So let's all do that for somebody, if it's just one person. Because what I want you guys to take from this today, I want you, you guys to just be intentional about being present for at least one person and then just let, let it catch on fire. Yeah. Um, I think the thing for me is we try to go through life being strong. We always want to appear that we're strong. We want people to think that we're strong. We don't want nobody to see our weaknesses. But within being strong is being able to say, I'm not okay. It's being able to say that I need help. And for me, when I, like I said, I have a, my bachelor's, bachelor's is in sociology with a minor in psychology, and I'm doing my master's in applied behavior analysis and just working on changing behaviors and stuff. And when I went to see my therapist last year, one of the things she said to me, she was like, you know this stuff. I'm like, yeah, I've sat through the classes. Yeah, like I've read it, I've read the books, I've done the assignments, I get it. But being able to apply it to myself is a different thing. And I always say, if you find the best surgeon in the world, Let's say the best heart surgeon in the world. That doctor cannot perform therapy on, I mean, surgery on himself. That's right. He got to go to somebody else in order to fix whatever it is that he needs to fix within himself. And that's okay. And so being able to say, I may have all the tools and all that, but sometimes we need somebody else to be there, to guide us. And I remember talking to my therapist one day, and I, I was telling her a situation, and she was like, well, how did you think, how do you think X, Y, Z felt at that time? And I had been over, playing this over and over in my head for so long, but for once, she made me look at it from a different perspective. It's like that meme where the man is, uh, two men are standing and it has a, a six on one side and a nine on the other side. Mm -hmm. And you're arguing, no, it's a six, no, it's a nine, no, it's a six, no, it's a nine. But until you have that one person that say, okay, you on the ledge right now. Let me pull you back. You're looking at this job not working out, relationship ended, but let's look over here. You got family that's supporting you. You got friends that's supporting you. You got business ventures coming through the doors in the future. You just got to look this way and focus on this path and let this go to the side because this ain't this don't matter right now. So I think that that's so important in order for us to be able to look at it from a different perspective. And that's what therapy has done. That's what going different different techniques, whatever it is that works for you, as long as you're willing to put in the work. So. Just that I'm not a doctor. I was a nurse, but I'm not a doctor. You ever heard of a functioning drug addict or a functioning alcoholic? With mental illness, they can be the same renderance. Um, it's a part of loss, the grieving, the anger, all those five phases that you go through. If you're having signs and symptoms, you can always call a 1-800 number and talk to them. And if you need to get some help, the professionals are the best ones to tell you. When COVID first came out, I ain't had time to be calling nobody else and getting on their nerves. I was calling every 1-800 number there was, 1-800 so-and-so every day, sometimes two and three times a day. 
um, if you're experiencing these things, the first thing you did was you spoke it out and you talked about it. Recognize. That's the first thing. Whether it is mental illness or it's just something that you're going through, but a lot of people fail to realize this. They think that mental illness is something that if you're 100 years old, that's what you've had 100 years old. Not necessarily necessary so. A trauma, anything can bring on mental illness. You can have her, her, her genetic, but with you recognizing it, it's best for you to talk to someone to see. And just because you go talk to a, a therapist or a doctor, that don't mean they gonna diagnose you and put you on some medicines and stuff. You might just need to go to a support group of a loss of a loved one. It's different avenues and things, but you admitted it and you talked about it. Now it is to you to seek some help, either regardless of what the help, direction the help sends you. It's your responsibility to yourself. Yeah, and I, I think, like you said, like temporary uh, depression. You know, for some of us, we had trauma as kids. And as for me at seven, eight years old, like my mental state, I, it wasn't developed enough in order to deal with a lot of the things that I saw at a young age. So as I got older, I was still stuck in that mental state that I was in at, a seven, at seven years old dealing with that trauma. And that led all the way up until my adulthood. So for someone who hasn't experienced at that type of trauma or like serious trauma, when it happens and it hits hard, it's like, why is this happening now? Because at that point, God has put you in a situation where now we have to test your strength. We have to see, can you withstand what you're dealing with right now in this moment? And the fact that you've been strong enough to make it to this point, you're only standing in the midst of a rainstorm. That rainstorm will go away. You just grab your umbrella and in the midst of it, think about the memories. Think about the things that the life that y'all built up into that point. And that's the strength that's going to propel you into that healing. What, what did it, what say you're saying, Demisha? Yeah, that's it. I'm going to heal for real. So now you're at a point where it's time for you to realize that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to miss him. It's okay to have those memories. And healing doesn't mean that you're forgetting about him. Yeah. Healing doesn't mean that you that the past and the, the, the relationship that y'all had for 30, I'm sorry for preaching, y'all, I'm sorry. But it don't, <laughs> it, don't mean, it don't mean that those 30 years was going away. It means that in this moment, you're doing what you got to do to get past the hurt and keep moving on with your life. But the memories and the love and all of that's still going to be there. It's still going to be there. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Sister Al, um, if you've been listening, you will hear the, the same thing you hear from everybody up here. Something happened to us to alter our thinking and took us down a dark path. And that's what happens when you have mental illness. Some are diagnosed and some are not. Um, but we want to keep this going because we can see the, the impact that's you know happening in this room right now. But we have to be respectful of the time of the people that are working for us and for the people that have been so generous to let us use the, use the building. But we do want to Stay in contact with you guys and, and let you know uh, what we have coming up next. We're going to do this. We're going to keep this going. This is not, this is just the first of many. And so we want to keep growing and growing. So go out and tell somebody, you know, what happened here for you today. Keep sharing it and look for us again in November. Um, we really appreciate you guys for coming out. Um, and we can't do this and continue to do it without your support. We have a, a PayPal uh, donation support link that we'll send out to you. And if you want to give today before you leave, you know, we greatly appreciate it so that we can keep it going and just keep building and building and increase the number of people who heal from awareness of how well we need, it's much needed for community support. So I just want to thank you all for coming out. Yeah. Um, and we love you all for being here. Minister New is going to take us out with a prayer, and then we're going to get out of here. Thank you so much. And don't let the conversation end here. That's like, right. Keep the conversation going. <laughs>